Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. The background tells us everything. We are going to be looking at the definitive interview with Otomo about Akira. Uh, really awesome. Before we dive into there, I do want to remind everybody at home that we are working cartoonists and the best way to support Cartoonist Kayfabe, buy our books. Ed Piscor's latest book, Red Room, available two volumes, Trigger Warnings and the Antisocial Network. Both of these are out now wherever books are sold, and they're both self-contained. So whichever volume you come across, that's the one to start with. Perfect for any horror reader out there. My latest, Street Angel Deadly Scroll Live, is back in print from Image Comics and The Plain Janes about a bunch of high school students who uh, start doing public art in their little community and cause all kinds of trouble. Grab those uh, from wherever you pick up your books, comic shops, Amazon, or your local library. But we are here today to talk Akira. Yes. And uh, some secrets from Otomo in the making of Akira, the selling of Akira, and uh, just making manga in general. This is part of a set called Akira Art of Wall. Yes. Right before I went out there in 2019, uh, and you could see the dates here, uh, there was this giant like skyscraper being erected in Shibuya, the Shibuya ward of, uh, of Tokyo. And rather than just have like those like planks of plywood to act as that fence to kind of create a perimeter around the construction site, uh, you got to figure it's the year 2019, which is the year that Akira takes place. In Akira, the 2020 Olympics are a thing, and that was going to be a thing if there yes. was no such thing as coronavirus and shit in Japan. So it was a big push to have like the kind of like, like Akira is happening. Yes. And around this entire perimeter of this building, they did three giant murals that changed over time. And then after the building was erected or whatever, they did uh, an art show to uh, almost monetize this shit. There was J Jim. I left a week before that show went on. Jim Mafood went there while it was going down. He took a picture in a big Akira seat with the yes. fluorescent light tube shit and the red cape. And but they really monetized this in a big way. There were like these little like plastic planks that like you could buy that you know create the entire uh, mural and stuff. But uh, I didn't even look at these things. This is the most I've, I've seen, uh, th these tapestry shits. Uh, but I, I got it because I, any information on Otomo and his process that I could get my hands on, I could, I'll, I'll almost pay any price. I'm such a mark. Sure. I, I hold that guy. He's, he's a Mount Rushmore kind of cartoonist, uh, one of the, 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 the true greats of the medium. So... You know, I'm almost like marking myself out in a way where I could be taken advantage of by these Kodansha and shit. But uh, I need I need the information. I need what he has to say about the medium of comics. And this interview book, there's two interviews. There's one which is solely with Otomo. And then there's one with uh, Katsuhiro Otomo and the guy who made the collage. That makes up the Art of Wall exhibit, uh, and he, as far as I know, that guy, he, he, his whole career is is that. Like he's built a whole career on making like weird collage things for big public spaces or something. So beautiful box set. We're gonna focus on the interview that's in this volume within the box set, but I did just want to show that off. The and accordion fold, like the production, and that's these are phenomenal. And that's the thing too. Objects. Like like Otomo has agency on everything he makes, and it all goes out of print, and it all becomes super expensive. So it went cheap on on uh, Amazon when I scooped it up. I think it was going for like 150, and for at least when I scooped it up, it was like 65, 70 bucks. So I can't speak on what it is now, but to me, it's it, it was worth it, kind of for the interview alone. And and you know that's what we'll be getting into in the, this conversation today. Yeah, it's a stunning document. Yes, it really is. So I am uh, pretty fresh to this. I read this uh, just this morning. Before, you know, we start recording, um, you know, so by all means, I'd kind of lead through this interview, but it's a relatively short interview. I will say that, you know, we're looking at about, oh, I don't know, six and a half, seven pages, something like that. That's the length of the interview with the Tomo from this book. There's some other content in here. I, I was blown away by this interview. Yeah. Like um, 
all credit to the guy asking the questions because they really get into some fascinating stuff. And I mean, we've covered a lot of interviews on here. We've done our own interviews on here. And um, this is really concise stuff, but covers a lot of information. So we'll try to cover as much of that as we can. And, and hopefully our retention level is high enough that we don't skip anything major. But it feels like every page has revelations. Yeah, it's true. Ones. It's true. Like the, the interviewer didn't ask the fanboy questions. No, they get into behind the scenes, production stuff, marketing stuff, editorial, like really, really kind of mind blowing. And I think that may be part of why this interview is so good. I, I assume not very many people have asked him these questions and maybe it was fun to answer some new questions. Right. Yeah, because it's not coming from that simple perspective of, you know, like, what exactly do the pills do or, or you know, shit like that. It's also interesting. Um, there's a sense of humility throughout, too. You know, right away, he's like, can I ask you some questions about Akira? And he's like, I don't remember much of it. You know, it's <laughs> I mean, at this point, geez, we're yeah. looking at 40 years ago almost for the beginning. Um, the interview, I believe, is. 2019 is that that's is that that's when the when building that... was up like, oh, okay. like like it's it's all it's all relatively new stuff for, like for 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 this this project gotcha uh but one of the things that i noticed we could start it off this way one of the things that i noticed and and just kind of realized when we when i was out there in, in tokyo this last time because akira is ubiquitous in 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 its tanko bond forms and uh i realized like it made me respect the comics format more because that's the only format that the Akira collections have ever seen. The traditional Tankobon is a six by nine book, pretty tiny. And I bought so many, I don't have one at hand right now, but it's pretty small. Maybe it's the size of your Plain Janes, actually. You know, maybe a little smaller, actually. Yeah, it might be. I, I was wondering, like, I'm, I'm looking up there and I don't know if there's Fist of the North Star are about right. They're, they're bigger. But, uh, but you can see this this is the size we know it as. And that's the only size it's ever been. And that's very, very, very atypical for Japan. Japan is an island, they're not making any more land, and they sell hundred they sell billions and billions of dollars worth of manga. So this is a super thick con each of these tanko bond is at least five hundred pages, and we find out that the first print run is two hundred thousand. So imagine just the warehousing of that. You know, that's could be insurmountable. I, I, I would love to hear, like, how many truckloads is that? Like, give me that number and what that translates to, you know, pallets, because it is it's hard to even imagine 200,000, 200,000 books, you know, this size and, and out he, there. And he talks about, like, when stores would have it, it would be two meter high. They, they He would see stores that they would have two two meter high stacks of those books. And being nervous that like, will, will will it even sell? Yeah, these are the, these are the Japanese versions. Yes, and uh, you can see like the edge pages are painted color. The original books are beautiful, just as as book design. But again, you see the size. You know, five hundred pages and and approximately same dimensions as what you have here. So, man, two meter high stacks. <laughs> Well, you know, how many copies is that even? You know, yeah. like that's what, 40, 50 books probably, right. you know, so 200,000 copies. And and that is atypical also, that he would wait 500 pages worth to collect them. It it sort of lets you know his position just financially at that stage because he wasn't rushing to uh, have these things in a Tanko Bond format. Typically, it would be maybe 10 chapters and then you'd have your trade paperback. There's like 30 chapters mm -hmm. per book here. So in some way, it's like leaving money on the table. In some way, it's an 18-volume set. If it was Fist of the North Star or One Piece or something like that, Dr. Slump was uh, 18 volumes. And, and it's about that amount of page real estate. But he was holding off. You know, he was in a position... Domu put him in a position where he could call his shots. And it is so atypical for a Japanese business person like for a person to do that you don't get out of line you listen to your elders you listen to the people at the higher position and the thing that i discovered is like if you just don't do that you could you could have a lot of advantages it could make you a social pariah if you're wrong he wasn't wrong right you know 
Yeah, and I don't know, Ed, did you say that they, they showed up, the test printing showed up as the oversize, and that's right. whenever he was like, this is how to do it. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, we do have these shown in jumps right here, which is the typical size of a magazine. So it's it's comic book size. Uh, Akira showed up in, in Young Magazine, not shown in Jump, but it's the same format. So this is the format that he got the test printings, like the stuff that they were showing, like, yeah, it'll look, look you know, this is the kind of thing. And he's And he's like, oh, okay, yeah, let's keep it that size. They said, no, we don't do that. Like, right. like collections are six by nine. And he's like, okay, well, we just won't do that then. He dra dragged his feet. We won't do that. And then what starts to happen is doujinshis show up where people are collecting. Like Jeff Darrow, we interviewed him. He, he discovered Akira when it came out. He knew, he knew about Domu and stuff. And so, like, in, he was already at Hanna-Barbera. There's, like, little Tokyo and shit out there. He's going to Kinokuniya Bookstore or whatever's out there at the time. And he got a subscription to Young Magazine. Had to pay probably $10 an issue every week in 1980. And he was just clipping out right. the, um, the Akira chapters in, in uh, Young Magazine. This is what people were doing out there. And it was customary. Like, if something's not collected... It's almost fair game in the Grey's markets of, like, doujinshi festivals and shit. There, there's overlap with Scanlation stuff that, that's sort of that way, you know? Like, where some of the Scanlation is, if it's not in print, <laughs> yes. If it's not in print, then, you know, it, it's fair game there. And once it comes in print, then maybe you take it down. Yeah. And so those fans would go and start photocopying these things and passing them around to the point that... It, it won an award. He won awards based on the fan version. Yeah. And, and uh, this is a good place to interject one of my recent projects. <laughs> um, we've shown this off in the past, but I, I made three new uh, copies of Fireball, Jamie Hewlett's 2000 AD book, and it's not been collected. So I like book binding and uh, ended up making my own versions of it because I want it to exist and I want to be able to read this. Yeah. And uh, for whatever reason, I misprinted my first try. So that's why I ended up doing another round of these. But it's the same kind of concept, right? I wanted this thing to exist, so I made it myself. This is not mass produced in a way that, you know, it's going to be eligible for awards or sold anywhere. But it's just that thing of, like, I wanted it. And that's what fans did with Akira before Akira was collected because the publisher wasn't ready to do exactly what Atoma wanted done. This is, That's amazing. The bootleg aspect. That's the lesson to me as a cartoonist is like, stick to your guns. If you've got a vision of this thing, yeah. really try to make that vision happen. And imagine Neo Tokyo this big. It just doesn't make sense. You were explaining this to me, and, and when you said there was no Tankobon of Akira, I was like, oh yeah, the art's too detailed. Maybe yeah. you just, the art like size-proofed it, which right. isn't the case, no. but... It does feel that way. Like it would, it would lose some if you shrunk it down that much. Like you, you picked up an oversized Domu. Yeah. And I look at that and think, how could you possibly print this smaller? Because right. it's so detailed. And it felt like I was seeing that work for the first time. Yeah. Because it was big and the details are so much more clear. And with the Kira, it's impossible to think about it small. Yeah. 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 It's, it's out of control. So like from the very beginning, like his vision with the Kira, it just diverged from all common wisdom of like what it is to be a, a manga so he answers questions that we presented from the last time i was in tokyo dude and i went to the yonazawa memorial library and dug out his copy mr yonazawa sensei's fucking copy of young magazine with that first chapter of akira where it showed the neo tokyo kind of countryside like for like a doppler radar kind of image and it was completely pixelated which is not in the book collections and it's in that first episode and i remember saying like did this guy paint each square how did he do that he explains it took a photograph uh and had a mosaic filter which i don't know what that is yeah i don't know exactly either like what a, mos a mosaic filter in 1980 like like what is that so so the painting that is in the collection is the original piece of art, but that defies the common wisdom of the mangaka of the day where that very little bit of color real estate that these guys would get, you would just draw the coolest, most dynamic image of your character. And he's drawn a Doppler radar with some like red infrared to show you 
the part of the Kanto region that is nuclear right now. I think it's worth noting this whole section kind of, it, it talks about the mosaic pattern, how they create that image, but it also gets into some of the other images that were used like on back covers of some of the collections, as well as um, shooting TV screens and stuff. And what I think it speaks let's to- start, Yeah, let's start with this th this aspect. Is This is a description to me of an artist who, think about the drawing that yeah. he's putting on the pages. Phenomenal. And yet he's still experimenting with all of these different techniques of like shooting a CRT television screen and putting that into his pages. Yeah, show that, man. This is comic Farewell to Weapons. I have three co three different versions of this. This is the original Japanese Tankobon collection. And this is what he's talking about. Like he had these images and took a photo, took a video of something and projected it for, on a TV uh, on like the president of... Kodansha's like, you know, the, his AV equipment took a photo of that television and that's how he achieved that imagery right there. I have a, uh, an Australian version of the Memories Collection that uh, is like the only other like American, like English o Otomo comics that you could get that weren't from like Epic Comics or whatever. Even though Farewell to Weapons is a single issue epic comic that you can get and you don't get this version you get this version and yes yeah, you see that over. you see this this image it's colored differently for the for the states like it, he's not using the crt he, for whatever reason man he's like maybe the americans can't handle that shit you may, maybe this looks weird to them i wonder if it looked weird to him i mean considering his control i wonder if he looked at this in print and was like i'm glad to experiment with it but Let's do the more traditional panel or maybe got feedback or something like that. Yeah. But I love this attention to experimentation and it's the same as the mo mosaic, you know, that he's putting yeah. in, in Akira in the beginning. And um, you'll see it throughout his work, but I think it speaks to the type of visual artist that he is. Right. Like really pushing, trying things, taking chances. And I, that's my favorite stuff. You know, like I want artists to really try things that they haven't seen before and in this case, you know, it's kind of like cutting edge technology that he's experimenting with on this. Um, the the part that they then run into is they start talking about some of the collections and some of the, I don't know, special effects that he's using on back covers of the collections and stuff. And there's a lot of context, you know, like one of the famous ones, I think, is this pinball collection on the back of volume four. Um, talks about getting a pinball machine and then like getting into it and building all of the artwork and like gluing this stuff down and that this was in his house for a while and how big it was. Right. <laughs> but it speaks to, again, this idea of like, I want this kind of image. I'm going to make the complete model that I can actually shoot from for this cover. And, Pretty cool and visionary. Yeah, and it's it's um, a consequence of the Japanese economy doing really, really, yes. really well. Yeah, this would have been in, in your mid to late 80s. Yeah, our early 80s. Really, like, and, and just, they had, he benefited so much from that economic boom. Yeah. That made, like, the... Uh, the anime possible at the level that it was made with all kinds of unique stuff. They went to a horse track in Tokyo that this is before Blade Runner Tokyo where like there's the big TV screens right. and shit in Shibuya. This was the biggest TV screen in all of Tokyo at the horse track and they made a deal with the horse track to just like put this up on screen for a second and this is Otomo back here taking the photo to what ends? Because it just looks Photoshop, like, you know, with like all the weird dot uh, half toning. And then with that, it looks fake as fuck. Well, he says eventually they had to, they, they did use uh, two images. Like the photo didn't work the way they wanted it to. I see. But you see again, this hungry artist. Yeah. And we mentioned about the economy being in this, um, in a bubble. Those aren't our words. That's his. You yeah. know, it's an artist who's conscious of the economy around him and taking advantage of those things. Yes. And an editor that, you know, he describes as this one editor as being um, a funny guy. And he, and he gives an example of him putting, like, pinups into some of these, you know, pinup girls yeah. into some of these comics. But that enabled him to approach that editor with these ideas. You know, this was an editor that was kind of on the same wavelength and a company at the time that had the money to, like, let's set up an entire like vendor stall of all of your Akira 
merchandise. Just just to take a picture, they hired a uh, a movie special effects guy, like a set decorator, to like build this whole thing just to take a photo for the back cover. Like that's the kind of excess. The Gordon Gecko shit was just not in America. Yes. Yeah, and I mean, I I just. I think it's something to take note of. You know, we talk about like stand up to the publisher and try to get your vision out there, but also like be aware of what's around you in terms of resources. And then what can you do with those resources to make something interesting or something that people haven't seen before? Yeah. You know, and that's, I mean, that's this book through and through and through. It is. So very inspiring reading this, this part and, and hearing about how he made some of this stuff. And I think there may have been some influence by, um, the interviewer asks him about, is he being approached for all of these products? And he was. He said from, you know, early on, like, people are coming at him to make all kinds of stuff, and he becomes very selective in what he makes, you know, for quality control and whatnot. But even with the movie, like, shows up very early on where they're they're approaching him about making the movie, which, I tell you, this is a different version of that movie than I expected to read about. Because he gets hooked up with, um, is it? Kadansha has like an animation yeah. wing at the time and they're doing lens man, yeah. which was a failure. Yeah. So it's not like he's showing up to a, a very uh, experienced movie studio and working there. It's like crazy chances. He describes it as I was completely fearless back then, like right. taking on this feature movie. And like, we all know how ambitious that movie was. Um, it's shocking that it was so, worked so well yeah totally and 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 so much was invested in him as like you know not the first time director but early certainly his first feature first feature right and uh the coffers that were opened up you know like there's no mistake you but it's real quick man like like the honda and the canon and all that kind of shit like there's no mistake that like that's product placement man you know because like because basically every big company put a couple of dollars in the kitty for this guy to get his vision across. And uh, it gets into some real cool story stuff, too, when he's talking about presenting it as, like, a standalone feature. Because that's where Domu comes into the conversation, where he talked about designing it almost like a movie, like a, a, like a real outline, yes. beginning, middle, and end. He yeah. has no interest in being a serialized mangaka. And uh, the, the interviewer brings up, like, yeah, you know, there are some comics that, that have you know, a hundred volumes and he scoffs, he laughs. He's like, he's like, see, that's no story. That's formula. That's a pattern. And what's interesting about that approach, and it actually put me in the mind of like Eddie P as art school student in a way. Cause like one of the things that overwhelmed me a lot in uh, art school was having respect for all the teachers and hearing diverging philosophies and being feel, feel, feeling like I was being pulled in a lot of different directions and then you realize, like, you just got to do you. You got to be who you are. So he's scoffing at the idea of, like, the formula and having 100 volumes of stuff. But it, like, that's a model for somebody. Like Akira for a lot of people. Like Akira Toriyama, like, he, he was happy to do that and, and benefited a lot. So, like, there's no hard law to it. You could find your lane and stick with it. And he knew that he isn't destined to be a guy staying up for five days straight to make his manga each week. He talks about Tezuka and Ishinomori, those guys who are no, like the dudes who have the biggest page count in, in the world and how like all their assistants are dead already and shit. Yes. How sick they were. There's so much there. First, let me say, I love that description of like the art school experience of having these different philosophies. Yeah. I think it's so important to stress that for anybody. I know a lot of creators watch this show. Yeah. That's the thing. Like there is no blueprint of like, this is how you do it. Right. There's, you know, whatever's pulling you, you can probably find models of success in that direction. Yeah. And so I'm glad to hear uh, Otomo kind of talk about that, you know, because certainly that serialized story seems to be the norm in a lot of manga. Yeah. And for him to like consciously not want to work that way and be so successful you know, I, that's the lesson I want people to take. Yeah. You know, like, find the thing that you really want to do and find a way to make that thing work. It's funny because he does poo-poo it, right? But he spent 10 years serializing this thing that if it was anybody else, it would be maybe 20 volumes. 
So he yeah. found a way to make it work like for himself within his own kind of taste levels or whatever. Yeah, and, and you know, going then on to everybody uh, working that way or how many pages they could produce in a month and you know, him kind of coming up in that system as an assistant, he does tell those stories about what that experience was like of just not liking what, didn't, didn't care about it, you know, the stuff that he was drawing, which was uh, Mahjong manga assistant where he's just drawing like the tiles he's he's he stayed up like the worst moment of that process was he stayed up four whole days at the studio just inking mahjong tiles with like rulers and tech pens and all that stuff and even in the midst of all of that he gets like a dot on one of the mahjong tiles incorrectly and they scold him for that and then he's a kid. He's 20 years old, 22 years old. Led Zeppelin's come into town. They're going to have a concert on NHK or something. He asks for a two-hour break after four whole days of not sleeping <laughs> to just, like, watch this Led Zeppelin concert. And they tell him, no, you can't do that. Yeah, it's... Oh man, it's the dark side, you know, the manga industry. Yeah, the 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 working four days without sleep, um, being an assistant that's drawing something you don't really want to draw, and that's all you're drawing. <laughs> like, it's really interesting to get that all that perspective from from one guy. Yeah. You know, that's really run that whole kind of gamut of the experience. Um, talks about his interest in science fiction. Uh, you mentioned the movie, you know, idea already, and and one of the things he talks about is structure. Which I've heard other people, I remember Dan Klaus talking about, like, if you want to learn structure, watch old television episodes. Right. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see those parallels. Uh, so it goes through some of the science fiction and just how important Kubrick's 2001 was. How, you know, he describes that as, like, that was the only sci-fi for, like, a decade. Yeah, before, and it was before hard to Star see. Wars. You know, after its first run, it didn't play again for a long time. So kind of interesting to see, like, what are the big influences or the big like moments yeah and and like him wanting to do sci-fi like there wasn't really something to point to at that time that was like successful in the way that Kodansha wanted to use his his talents and abilities like he had to fight to do fireball yeah yeah nobody was drawing sci-fi uh you know he said he wanted to draw sci-fi and they said no there was no sci-fi manga at that point yeah that's so wild to think about that too when you it think is. about the genres that come in and out of fashion and I mean, it's one of the great things now that, that we can self-publish, you yeah. know, we can crowdfund, we can do all these different ways to make the stuff we want to make that wasn't always available. So, yeah, I mean, I, I often feel that way of like, there's so many tools we have now that like in the past dudes had to fight hard to get what they wanted. Yeah. And then it, it, just that sci-fi thing, it makes me think like, they must have like a bunch of subgenre shits where that that's concerned because it's not like you know going to guy has been making comics for a long long time and like if you don't call that shit sci-fi like what do you call it? Yeah, good point. Uh, and then give some history of like Fireball and parallels between Fireball and Akira. Yeah, which you know we've talked about in past episodes. It's the same universe. Let me grab something real fast, man. Because, like, one of the things that uh, that I mentioned after we did, like, Fireball and Domu was, like, it's all the mm. same universe. It's all, like, uh, the stuff that happens in Domu is, like, the first part of the story. Then Fireball is, like, the weaponization by way of the military of that, like, ESP psycho powers. And then Akira takes place afterward, you know? Uh, so the guy in Fireball is like number one. Like that's from Fireball. This is from Fireball. Uh, the little old dude is up here somewhere. Yeah, Old Man Cho is right there. This is Old Man Cho's mouth. It's the kids when they're like ghosts at the end of Akira. There's Akira there. So this is, it's all Fireball, Domu, Akira making up this imagery, corroborating my thought. Yes, visual confirmation <laughs> yes. right there. Yes. What, a, what a spectacular and, and collage. People, and I showed this up. People were like, oh, yeah. that's just from the Art of Wall. This is not from the Art of Wall. This is a drawing that, that Otomo did uh, years before Art of Wall. So get your shine box. Wow. I would have assumed that was a collage. Interesting. So, again, um, you know, it's a, it's a guy that's kind of doing what he wants to do and, and fighting to get it get there. Yep. This is pretty fun. Talks about there's um, not really one protagonist in Akira, which yeah. is atypical. 
And I think that's a good summary of that story. You know, like by the time you're getting into those later volumes, it really is like every character has their path, their agency. Um, it makes for incredible reading. We uh, interviewed Robert Kirkman, creator of uh, Walking Dead, and he brought up that, that term, uh, story engine. And so much of manga, really, like the best of manga, like the most popular of manga, they all have story engine components to it where, you know, these motherfuckers got to come up with 15 pages a week. Otomo did that. For all he says he dislikes about, you know, serialized manga, his stuff was all serialized. Domu was serialized. Uh, you got to come up with something every week. So you come up with your story engine, which is the driving force, the universe where these things could happen. And then you, that's the macro. And then your weekly chunk is the micro. So if you come up with that compelling piece... You know, find seven Dragon Balls, get them together, you get to make a wish. That's a good story engine. And then you could just create any characters you want to, like, exist with, with, within that space, man. You know, Fist of the North Star, I'm, re I'm rereading those, those trades, man. Got this fucking nuclear holocaust. So there's no resources. Everybody's fighting for resources. And it's got to be brutal. Like, civilization's done, so now Brawn is going to supersede brains you could do a zillion things with that and akira you know same deal it's a, it's neo tokyo you come up with five ten good characters and then just let's see what they're doing at any given time um this kind of wraps up licensing stuff and it reminded me a little bit of bill waterson at this point he says you know he pretty much turns down everything um but once in a while does a collaboration usually with someone who's super persistent this was my takeaway but becomes more selective in it also talks about, you know, once the book is done and, and printed, it's like no longer his. It's out. Yeah. And uh, and he's sort of done with it. Um, I've heard other creators talk that way. I think that's pretty interesting. But you, I mean, personally, do you, you don't feel that way? Like I do feel that way. Like, yeah. Like you've it's going to be a year before you put pencil to paper on your last page of Hulk Grand Design by the time that trade comes out. Right. Yeah. I, I right. Exactly. And, and you hear it from a lot of creators, I guess. Um, but the the kind of the marketing licensing piece of it, interesting that, you know, he's stepped back when you think of how many posters and shirts and all the things that have been done. Um, and the fact that, that there is still so much out there. Uh, but and you, you see it because like the, the the most popular of manga, like it's there these these like cyclical industries unto themselves where. The, the comic points to the anime, points to the the video game, points to the action figures. And that's like the basic ones. And then you've got like, you know, that Kinnikuman eyeglass holder, Gashopons, uh, shirts. All, there's a Kinnikuman store. And at the Kinnikuman store, there isn't one comic sold. It's wrestling jackets that are like reversible <laughs> of like the different teams and shirts and all... Uh, you know, five hundred dollars statues. Not one comic is visible in the Kinnikuman stores. That's shocking. Yeah, it's all the merch. Wow, prints and stuff. So I think that's uh, you know that covers this interview. We forget anything in here that that stood out to you? No, just another one of, like the fun aesthetic things is talking about like after he won the battle of like this book is going to be printed bigger than you know traditional Tanko Bond. Then he's like. Well, the sides of the pages have to be yellow on this first volume. And they're like, what? And he's like, yeah, like I want, I want, I want there to be colored, color blocking on, on the books. So he basically is just like, when he gets something, he's asking for more. And, and I, I respect that. Cause like the, the average creator is very timid and will, uh, allow themselves to be led by the nose a little bit, like thankful enough th to just get to be published. But he like won this battle. He's like seeing how far he can, t can take things. But there's, there is a positive benefit to that in a lot of ways, man, because anything that deviates from the norm has a cost, has a financial cost to it. So now he's getting Kodansha more and more and more invested into this thing. So they have to sell it. Like, so it's going to, you know, it's it's not if if it if they're betting on the wrong pony, it's good money after bad. But if you're betting on the right guy, you create you create you know something massive, and 
that's what he got out of them. He got good promo dollars after that to the point where they can buy time on the screen at the Jumbotron. Yeah, it's it's kind of neat, too, for all the intricacy of that story. When he's talking about those color edges, um, they they ask him if he had the same color you know in mind for each volume. And he says he just knew that he wanted yellow for the first one and thought it would be weird you know if they were all yellow. And so he wasn't thinking further than the first one. And then once it came out and it was like, oh... I just decided the colors on the spot after yellow, blue, third one should be orange. There wasn't a big plan. I love that, that there's still room for spontaneity and sort of him discovering stuff along the way through the process. When, when I think of Akira, it feels so precise. Yeah. So I like that there's some spontaneity there and they get into like, you know, the back covers that we talked about a little bit and just kind of like his vision for the books themselves, the book collections. And he says, I wanted the book to be something that would look cool if you carried it around. It's such a great description, and I feel like, again, to all the makers that are watching, think that way. Dude. You know, like, like really think that way. Um, because I, I don't know that we always do think that way. Hey, but, you, but you always notice, like, at the festivals, when there's a real sexy book, you see it in people's hands and you know it, you know? Kind of like kind of like when we were at um, CXE, that Ryan Alves dude, like... He had that that Batman vs. Bane comic, and it had that super bright background, uh, that back cover. And I saw people walking around with that, and I'm like, you know, it's a perversion of Dick Sprang and shit. And I'm like, what is that book? Yes. And I saw that in people's hands and was like, what is that freaking book, man? And then he came by and hooked it up, and it's like, yeah, that's money. Well... Great interview. Great interview. So much information in there. Hopefully uh, some stuff people out there can, can use and hopefully some answers that, you know, the questions that, that n- we aren't the only ones who had these questions. Yeah. Clearly. Yeah. Um, so what a document. Very awesome. Very inspiring. Uh, you came over this morning. I'll be like, dude, you got to just just sit down and read this because I feel like it has to be an episode. And I know that uh, a bunch of the makers out there are going to be uh, appreciative to hear about, you know, some some of the stuff that's unearthed in the conversation yeah absolutely good to go jimmy i am okay favors like follow subscribe to the youtube channel hit the bell we'll notify you when new vids are available jimmy tell the people what's out there man street angel deadly squirrel live fresh new printing available now plain janes the adventures of a bunch of high school uh, outsider artists kind of disrupting the status quo in their little town hulk grand design Eventually, there is a large, oversized collection coming. I don't know when, but pre-order that one now. It'll get here eventually. And join me on patreon.com slash jimrug, where you can see a lot more of my comics, art, and how I make the comics I make, and uh, download out-of-print zines and mini-comics there. Red Room, Trigger Warnings. Red Room, the antisocial network. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game in Red Room Comics. And each of these trade paperbacks, each of these Tanko Bond, uh, contain four complete self-contained stories, I'm working on the next round of Red Room as we speak, and I'm serializing those comics on my Patreon. Uh, Three bucks for the archive. More than 350 pages worth of stuff up there as we speak, man. Uh, Less than a penny a page. Uh, Go to my link tree in the description below to order these comics. Check out the Patreon, all that good stuff. Jimmy, tell the people what else we have out there, man. Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts, merchandise, cups, mugs, uh, Fanny packs, all kinds of great stuff at our spread shop. That link is also below this video. Another great way to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Given those marching orders, Jimmy, will be on our way. Read more manga.